For 40 years, if you saw a UFO over the Nevada desert, chances are you didn't see an alien. You saw the mind of Kelly Johnson. He built planes that flew higher than the atmosphere and faster than a rifle bullet. He built ghosts. He was the most secretive engineer in American history, and it all started in a smelly circus tent next to a plastic factory. Clarence Kelly Johnson was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was the son of Swedish immigrants born in a remote mining town in Michigan. He was poor, he was tough, and he was brilliantly, arrogantly intelligent. At school, they bullied him because of his name. He fought back. In fact, he fought so hard they gave him a nickname, Kelly. He carried that fighting spirit into the polite, reserved world of aviation engineering, and he shattered it. 1933, Johnson joins the Lockheed Corporation. He is 23 years old. Most junior engineers keep their mouth shut and fetch the coffee. Not Kelly. On his very first assignment, he looked at the senior designer's model for the Electra airliner and told him, this is unstable, it's rubbish. The senior engineers were horrified. Who was this kid? But there was a problem. He was right. Johnson fixed the design. The Electra became a legend. And suddenly, Lockheed realised they had a tiger by the tail. By 1937, war was brewing. The US Army needed a fighter. But they didn't want just any fighter. They wanted a high-altitude interceptor. The requirements were absurd. They wanted it to fly at 360 miles per hour and climb like a rocket. Every other company said, it can't be done with one engine. So, Kelly said, fine. I'll use two. He designed the P-38 Lightning. It was a radical beast. Instead of a fuselage, it had a central pod for the pilot and guns, and two massive booms for the engines and turbo superchargers. It looked like two planes welded together. Critics called it ugly. They called it a monstrosity. But when it flew, it didn't just fly. It screamed. It was the first fighter to top 400 miles per hour. It was so fast that it encountered a new, deadly phenomenon that no pilot had ever faced before. Compressibility. As the plane approached the speed of sound, the air couldn't move out of the way fast enough. It formed a shock wave. The controls would freeze. The plane would dive into the ground, killing the pilot. It was a terrifying mystery. The sound barrier wasn't just a wall, it was a graveyard. Kelly Johnson didn't sleep. He worked the problem. He designed dive flaps, a simple metal strip to disrupt the shockwave. While other engineers were guessing, Johnson was calculating. He saved the plane. And the plane saved the war. The P-38 was the plane that shot down Admiral Yamamoto, the architect of Pearl Harbor. Did you know the mission was flown in total radio silence? 1943. The P-38 is dominating the Pacific. But in Europe, a new threat has emerged. Reports are trickling in from intelligence agencies. Germans have something new. A plane without propellers. The Messerschmitt ME-262. The US Army Air Forces panicked. They were fighting a jet war with piston engines. They were bringing a knife to a gunfight. Enter the Americans' desperation. The Air Force calls Lockheed. They need a jet fighter. And they need it yesterday. They ask for a meeting. They tell Kelly Johnson, We need a jet prototype. How long will it take? Two years? Three years? Kelly looks at them. He doesn't blink. I'll give you a jet in 180 days. The room went silent. 180 days was impossible. It takes 180 days just to design the landing gear. But Johnson had a condition. He said, I can do it, but you have to leave me alone. No bureaucracy, no inspections, no interference. I pick the team, I pick the hours, and nobody, absolutely nobody, tells me how to run my shop. The general agreed. But there was a catch. Lockheed was busy building bombers. There was no space in the factory for Kelly's secret project. So they improvised. Kelly rented a circus tent. 
He found an old machine shop next to a smelly plastics factory. The stench was unbearable, a mix of burning plastic and rotting chemicals. One of the engineers, wearing a gas mask, made a joke. He answered the phone, Skonk works! A reference to a moonshine factory in a popular comic strip. The name stuck. The Skunk Works was born. Johnson handpicked 23 engineers, the best of the best. He laid down the law. He created the 14 Rules of Management. Rule number 12. There must be mutual trust between the military and the contractor. Rule number 13. Access by outsiders strictly restricted. He created a cult of speed. Be quick, be quiet, be on time. The clock was ticking. They had no computers, no calculators, just slide rules and intuition. They worked 10 hours a day, six days a week. Kelly Johnson was everywhere. He was checking rivets. He was shouting at suppliers. He was sweeping the floor. On day 130, the engine finally arrived. It was a British engine, the Goblin, supplied by none other than Frank Whittle's company. Yes, history is connected. Day 143, 37 days ahead of the impossible schedule. The XP-80 shooting star was ready. They towed it out to a dry lake bed. The desert sun beat down on the fuselage. The pilot climbed in. The British engine whined to life. Kelly Johnson stood by the side of the runway, chewing on a cigar. He had bet his entire reputation on this moment. It flew. It was the first operational American jet fighter. It was sleek, it was fast, and it was built in a tent by a bunch of rebels who ignored every rule in the book. The army was ecstatic. They ordered mass production immediately. Kelly Johnson hated bureaucracy. Do you think modern innovation is slowed down by too many rules? Let me know your thoughts. But for Kelly Johnson, the P-80 was just the appetizer. The war ended before the plane saw much combat. The Nazis were defeated. But a new enemy was rising in the East. The Soviet Union. And this new war, the Cold War, wouldn't be fought with guns. It would be fought with secrets. The government needed eyes in the sky. They needed a plane that could fly so high that Russian radar couldn't see it. Kelly Johnson was about to receive the phone call that would change aviation forever. He was going to build the U-2. But this time, the challenge wasn't speed, it was altitude. And the pilot wouldn't be a soldier, he would be a spy. Kelly Johnson had proved he could build a jet faster than anyone else. But the world was changing. The Nazis were gone, replaced by a silent, brooding enemy, the Soviet Union. America was blind. The Soviets had tested an atomic bomb in 1949. Stalin was building missiles, but nobody knew where, and nobody knew how many. President Eisenhower needed eyes inside Russia. But sending a plane over Soviet territory was an act of war. Unless... The plane was so high, they couldn't touch it. Enter the CIA. They didn't want a fighter, they wanted a spy. They approached the Air Force with a radical idea. A plane that could fly at 70,000 feet. To put that in perspective, airliners today cruise at 35,000 feet. 70,000 feet is the edge of space. The sky turns black. The curvature of the Earth becomes visible. At that height, Russian radar would struggle to track it, and their missiles would simply run out of fuel trying to reach it. The Air Force said it was physically impossible. The air is too thin to support wings. So the CIA rang Kelly Johnson. Kelly didn't argue. He simply redesigned the aeroplane. He took the fuselage of a fighter jet and bolted on massive glider-like wings. He called it the CL-282. The CIA called it the U-2. But there was a problem. To reach that altitude, the plane had to be incredibly light. Every gram mattered. K-1 
Kelly was obsessive. He removed the armor. He removed the ejection seat system. He even removed the landing gear. He designed pogo wheels, stabilizers that fell off the moment the plane took off. To land, the pilot had to balance the plane on a central bicycle wheel like a circus act. It was dangerous. It was fragile. It was essentially a flying camera made of tinfoil. But where do you test a secret plane that doesn't officially exist? You can't fly it at a public airport. Kelly looked at a map of the Nevada nuclear test grounds. He found a dried up salt flat called Groom Lake. It was remote. It was hostile. It was perfect. He called it Paradise Ranch to trick the workers into coming. Today, we know it by a different name. Area 51. Kelly Johnson didn't just build the plane, he built the base. Area 51 is now the most famous secret base in the world. Do you think the government is still hiding advanced technology there today? August 1955. The U-2 flies. It climbs to 70,000 feet. The pilots, wearing partial pressure suits because their blood would boil if the cabin depressurized, looked down on the world like gods. For four years, the U-2 was invincible. It flew over the Soviet Union with impunity. It photographed bomber bases, missile silos, and submarine yards. The Russians could see it on their radar, but they could do nothing. Their MiGs would stall trying to reach it. Their missiles exploded miles below. Kelly Johnson had built a ghost. But technology never stands still. May 1st, 1960. Pilot Francis Gary Powers is flying deep over Sverdlovsk, Russia. He feels safe. He is untouchable. But the Russians had developed a new missile, the SA-2 Guideline. And they didn't just fire one, they fired a barrage. A shockwave from a nearby explosion snapped the U-2's fragile long wings. The plane disintegrated. Powers didn't die. He bailed out and was captured. It was a geopolitical catastrophe. The United States was caught red-handed spying. The invincible plane lay in pieces in Gorky Park. Kelly Johnson watched the news in horror. His creation hadn't failed. Physics had just caught up with him. He realised that altitude was no longer a shield. If you can't hide up high, there is only one other way to survive. You have to outrun the bullet. The CIA came back to the Skunk Works. They were terrified. They can hit us at 70,000 feet, they said. What do we do? Kelly Johnson leaned back in his chair. He had already been thinking about this. We stop floating, he said, and we start sprinting. He proposed a plane that would fly at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, faster than a rifle bullet. A plane so fast that by the time the enemy radar detected it, it would already be gone. But at Mach 3, the friction of the air is so intense that aluminium, the metal all aeroplanes were made of, would melt like butter. The plane would have to be built out of something else. Something incredibly rare, incredibly hard to work with, and incredibly expensive. Titanium. There was just one problem. The United States didn't have enough titanium. Do you know who did? The Soviet Union. In one of the greatest ironies of the Cold War, the CIA set up fake companies to secretly purchase the titanium from Russia. The Soviets were selling the very metal that Kelly Johnson would use to build the spy plane designed to defeat them. Project Oxcart. It looked like a dagger. It leaked fuel on the runway because the metal panels were designed to expand only when hot. It was the most difficult engineering challenge in history. They had to invent new tools just to cut the metal. They had to invent new fuel that wouldn't explode at 400 degrees. Kelly Johnson was pushing his team to the breaking point. But he wasn't just building a plane. He was building a legend. 1964. The Skunk Works has built the successor to the U-2. It is sitting on the tarmac at Area 51. It looks like a spaceship. But there is a problem. It is leaking fuel. To an outsider, it looks broken. A disaster. 
but to Kelly Johnson, it is perfect. You see, this plane is designed to fly so fast, over 2,000 miles per hour, that the friction of the air will heat the titanium skin to 500 degrees Celsius. The metal will expand. The panels will stretch. If he built it tight on the ground, it would rip itself apart in the air. So, he built it loose. It only seals itself when it screams. The SR-71 Blackbird. The pilots who flew it didn't wear flight jackets. They wore space suits. They were flying at the edge of space, three times the speed of sound. At that speed, you are faster than the rotation of the Earth. You can watch the sun set, turn the plane around and watch it rise again in the west. It was the ultimate engineering paradox, a plane that was fragile on the ground but invincible in the sky. Kelly Johnson had solved the missile problem with brute force physics. The standard operating procedure for an SR-71 pilot when a surface-to-air missile was detected was simple. There were no fancy manoeuvres, no banking, no diving. The pilot simply pushed the throttle forward. The Blackbird would accelerate. The missile, travelling at its maximum speed, would try to intercept, but the plane was moving so fast that the missile would simply run out of fuel and fall back to Earth. It was the only aircraft in history that could outrun a bullet. But building the ultimate plane took a toll. Kelly Johnson ran the Skunk Works like a dictator. He was known for his nickel tour. If an engineer made a mistake, Kelly would walk up to him, flip a nickel onto his desk and say, Call your wife. Tell her you've been fired. He was brutal. He was demanding. But his team loved him. Because he protected them. When the Air Force generals tried to interfere with the design, Kelly threw them out. When the bureaucrats tried to cut the budget, Kelly threatened to quit. He built a wall around his engineers so they could do the impossible. As the 1970s rolled in, the world changed again. Radar was getting better. Speed was no longer enough. The Soviets were building faster missiles. Kelly knew the era of faster and higher was ending. The next era would be invisible. Before he retired, he laid the groundwork for the next revolution, stealth. He passed the torch to his protege, Ben Rich. But the DNA of the skunk works, the secrecy, the speed, the can-do attitude, that was all Kelly. Kelly Johnson retired in 1975. He had designed 40 aircraft. He had won every aviation award in existence. He had advised presidents. But without the pressure, Without the deadlines, without the smell of jet fuel and titanium, he faded. He once said, I'll design an aeroplane for you, but I won't suffer fools. In retirement, he watched as the aviation industry became bloated, slow and bureaucratic, everything he hated. The man who built a jet in 143 days watched as new planes took 20 years to develop. In 1990, the SR-71 was retired. On its final flight, it broke one last record. It flew from Los Angeles to Washington DC in 64 minutes. The pilots walked out of the cockpit and handed the flight log to the Smithsonian Museum. The ink was still wet. Kelly Johnson died that same year. It was as if he and his greatest creation were tied together by an invisible string. When the bird stopped flying, the master stopped breathing. Today, if you visit the Smithsonian, you can stand under the Blackbird. You can see the titanium skin that rippled at Mark III. You can see the leak points. It looks like science fiction, but it wasn't built by aliens. It was built by a poor boy from Michigan who refused to listen to the word impossible. Kelly Johnson didn't just build planes, he built the future. And he did it in a tent, with a slide rule and a promise. Be quick, be quiet and be on time.